going to share our worship time a little bit differently this morning. Uh, we belong to a denomination called the CBOQ, the Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec. And across that denomination today, we are observing the day of prayer for the persecuted church. Around the world, there are some 360 million Christians who are living in countries where to be a Christian is not just unpopular, it's not just inconvenient, it is in fact illegal by the law of the land. Where our Bibles, of which we have so many scattered around this room and in pockets and in purses, is illegal. And people are persecuted, people go to jail, they are physically attacked, their homes are burned down, and they suffer in very real ways for the cross of Christ and their, their faith in Jesus. So what we're going to do this morning is our worship time is going to be maybe just a little bit like what it would be like to worship in a persecuted church. We're going to have an opportunity for people to share a scripture verse or to ask for a chorus to be sung, something that's familiar, something that people might know, um, or just a scripture verse that is meaningful or encouraging. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story, and then we're going to worship together in a way that identifies with our persecuted brothers and sisters in the world in just a very small way. So I woke up this morning and I went to church. I wasn't sure I was going to. Even until I woke up this morning, I wasn't sure I was going to because I heard yesterday through the grapevine that Jeff wasn't going to be here and Ruth wasn't going to be here because they were both arrested yesterday for preaching the gospel. Their families haven't heard anything. There hasn't been any news of their condition or where they are or when they might be released or whether they might be released. So where that leaves the church, I don't know. So I was really, really frightened by that news. I was really nervous last night, even until I went to bed, wondering, should I go to church? Is it safe? So I tossed and turned for a long time during the night, trying to decide and, and praying and, and asking God, you know, what's going on? You know, what should I do? And then I finally fell asleep. And I, when I woke up in the morning, I knew that I had had a dream. And I couldn't remember exactly what was in the dream, but I knew that in that dream, the Holy Spirit had said this to me. He had said, things are not going to get any easier. You have a family of faith. Don't be alone. So I decided that I would gather up my courage and I would go to church. I dug out my, my, my passage of the Bible. I have, I have two Gospels and I have three of Paul's letters. And I keep them in a very safe place. But I picked them up and I took them with me to church this morning. And when I got there, I sat down and I looked around the circle at my sisters and at my brothers. My sisters and my brothers, some of them like me, they have little sections of the Bible. They don't have the whole thing, but they have sections and they, we share them around between each other and we make copies when we can make copies. And, uh, but, but I mean, some people have like the whole Bible. They have like all of God's word, the whole thing. And they're really good about sharing it when they can, but they have to keep it hidden in a safe place uh, when, they're, when they're not reading it because we don't have very many full copies of the Bible in our church. And some of the people in our church are, are new to the faith. And, you know, they're just starting to learn some of the songs we sing together, and they're just starting to memorize the scriptures, as we've all been doing. Some of us have been Christians for years and years, and they know all the songs. And they have memorized chapters and even entire books of the Bible. They have them in their minds and in their hearts. And they can just call them up like that. 
So as I sit in my small, frightened church this Sunday morning, and I look around, I know that even though there is no pastor in the room, and even though I don't know when our pastor will be back, the work of the church continues. The worship and the teaching continues in and between each one of us, brothers and sisters of our faith. And as we sit in a circle, we take time to pray. And different ones of us share a scripture and read it out or speak it out from memory. And different ones of us ask for a song to sing, one that's familiar, one that people will remember. And we spend our time together worshiping. And it begins with one sister standing up and saying this. Repeat this scripture after me. We have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that this all-surpassing power, show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Is from God and not from us. We are pressed on every side but not crushed. We are pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body Carry around in our body the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may always be revealed. May always be revealed. That's from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, chapter four. And that is the word of the Lord. Now who else would like to suggest or share something for us to worship together this morning. Ken. Thank you. Right, right, right there. We got a drum. No. Okay, I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, finish our worship time together by singing the first verse of "Amazing Grace," the song that reminds us that God works for and through and in all of us, in all things. And the last verse, all right. <laughs> if I forget the words. You gotta help out, kid. Again, <laughs> that's it, when we've been there, right? When yeah. we've been there, all right. So the last verse is when we've been there 10,000 years. So we'll sing that one as well. Amazing grace, how sweet. Read from 1 Peter chapter 4. (coughs) 
First Peter chapter four. That's on page 1891 in the brown Bible in the pew in front of you. First Peter chapter four. Starting to read at verse 12 and going to verse 19, which I think is the end of the chapter. Yep. First Peter chapter four, starting at verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome? What will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. May the Lord bless to our hearts the reading of his word. The relationship between the church and society at large, between the Christian community and the community beyond these four walls, has always been a difficult one throughout history. In many ways, the church lives a life of paradox, a life of tension when it comes to its relationship with the broader community, and even going back to the beginning of the church in the book of Acts. The early church in the book of Acts had found favor with the community around them. They, they blessed many, they, they earned the respect of many. And in the same way, we in the 21st century must seek to act in a way that, that brings salt and light to the community around us, to act in a way that will bless the community around us and even earn the respect of the community around us. To act in such a way that if First Baptist Church disappeared tomorrow, the, church, the community would, would notice, would say, hey, where'd you go? We miss you. This is something that we would want to strive for as a church here on the corner of Augusta and John Streets in Port Hope. Yet there's another side to the church's interaction with the community around them that was seen in the first century church and which we can expect to see in the church in the 21st century as well, if we're doing the job that God is asking us to do. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read this. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. In Acts chapter 12, verse 1, it says that it was about this time that King Herod had arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. And the chapter goes on to say that Herod had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword, and that Peter was thrown into prison. So even though the early church earned the respect of many in the community, they also earned persecution from other quarters of society. Many people in the first century found the Christians to be a threat. The priests were unhappy with them, because in their minds, they were causing people to turn away from the right religion by being converted to this Christianity religion. While some religious leaders were no doubt concerned for their flock and convinced that they were being led astray by some cult and some false religion, I think most were probably concerned with their loss of influence. Their hundreds of rules that they had would, would no longer have an effect on people that were now not living by works, but were living by grace. And the kings and the secular rulers were concerned about and angry towards the Christians because they were encouraging people to worship a god other than Caesar. They were upsetting the apple cart. They were upsetting the natural order of things, according to the kings and secular ru rulers. And they feared a community of people that didn't fear them, right? They were kind of, they, their power and authority, when push came to shove, rested in fear. And so these religious leaders, they feared losing their influence and control over the people, the people that didn't fear them anymore. They did not know what to do with the people who worshipped not out of fear, but out of love and adoration. And the merchants, well, the merchants were some of the people most troubled by the Christians. 
The impact of Christianity was having a direct result on their, a direct impact on their livelihood. The money they made off the sale of idols and other instruments of worship were, were being lost as people began to understand that the worship demanded by the one true God was a worship in spirit and truth, not a worship through works, not a worship through having to buy the right trinkets from these different merchants in order to, to come to the temple and, and make the gods happy. In all instances, these groups saw the, Christ, the Christians as cutting in on their territory. And they thought, well, something has to be done. This, this can't continue. And because each of these groups held a degree of power in first century society, they had the ability to do something about these troublesome meddling Christians. And their solution was to begin to systematically persecute the Christian believers. Now, the goal of any type of persecution is to get someone to change their mind and to change, more probably accurately, to change their behavior. To get someone to stop believing what they believe or, or at the very least to, to just believe it in secret and stop acting on their beliefs. And the goal of any kind of persecution is to get you to stop threatening the existing order, to get you to stop questioning conventional wisdom. The goal of persecution is to get you to believe and act just like everyone else, to get you to believe and act like the ones persecuting you. What does persecution look like today? How is it the same or different than what we see in the first century church? Well, the answer really depends on where you live. At its core, persecution happens when others feel they need to attack you for your faith, attack you for what you believe, and how you act based on those beliefs. And in North America, persecution is relatively benign. It can look like being made fun of at school for going to church. It can look like being mocked at work for your beliefs or within your family circle. I think increasingly in our society, persecution looks like having the faith shunted to the sidelines, making the church irrelevant, having faith removed from the public square as, as a, a legitimate motivation for someone's position on different issues. It displays itself in an attitude that says, whatever you believe is fine for yourself, just keep it to yourself and don't impose it on others. As if just expressing a different view and adding another voice is like imposing it on somebody. Persecution takes more harmful forms when you find yourselves not allowed to do stuff because of your faith and your beliefs. When you are disqualified from certain jobs or certain schools because of your faith. And we see this more in many other countries around the world, but it does creep in from time to time in North America in some contexts. Persecution happens in many countries where you're not allowed to meet openly in church like this, unless you're in a government-sanctioned church and you're forced to meet and worship underground. In the passages we read in Acts, persecution took the form of imprisonment and even death. Again, this is a foreign concept to us in North America, but to many Christians around the world, especially in communist and Islamic countries, this is a reality of daily life. The Voice of the Martyrs is a Christian ministry that supports the persecuted church around the world and shares their stories with other believers in countries like ours. And even though a number of countries around the world are former communist countries where there's some measure of freedom of religion now, and Christians are no longer persecuted to the same extent, Voice of Martyrs still presently considers 54 countries around the world to be places where Christians encounter extreme or very high levels of persecution because of their faith in Christ. The number I had for 2021 was 309 million Christians. Ruth had quoted 360 million Christians. It's over 300 million Christians are living in places with very high or extreme levels of persecution. And the Voice of the Martyrs 2021 report states that every day, 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Fern and I were talking, so that, that's like every two hours. Where someone around the world is killed because of their Christian faith. Every day, 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted, all because of their faith. And I'm preaching it myself when I say this, but I, we all need to work harder at intentionally informing ourselves as to what's going on in countries where our Christian brothers and sisters are being seriously persecuted 
and to pray for them and to find practical ways to help them. The Voice of the Martyrs website is a good place to start. We support a couple in Lebanon, their name is the Haddads, and Mr. Haddad is the president of a Baptist seminary in Beirut, Lebanon, which is not a persecuted country, but they draw students from all over the Arab world from many persecuted countries, teach them, train them how to be pastors, and then send them back home to, to, to do a very risky job of pastoring and being a Christian leader in their country. And we have the privilege of being able to, with our missions dollars, just in a tiny, tiny way, provide financial support for the Haddads. And prayers for their safety and for their students can be an important way to support them. We mentioned before that persecution happened in the early church when the Christians started cutting in on the territory of the religious and secular leaders and the merchants, and they decided they needed to do something about it. In a broader, more spiritual sense, persecution happens when we begin to cut in on the enemy's territory, and he decides he needs to do something about it. And so he draws people to persecute the church and to persecute Christians. I came across a definition of spiritual warfare a number of years ago that always made sense to me. And it was John Dawson from Youth with a Mission, and he described spiritual warfare as going into an area where the enemy has control and a foothold and going and doing the exact opposite. So in a North American context, that might look like you know, going into a situation where greed is front and center and being generous, just doing the exact opposite of what's going on in society around you. Anytime we act in a way that glorifies God in situations where the devil has a foothold will create confrontation, and it will invite some form of persecution. Now, it's not our goal to, in, you know, intentionally invite persecution. One of my favorite Christian singers, Keith Green, used to always say, it doesn't say in Scripture, blessed are you when you are obnoxious for my name's sake. Persecution that we bring on ourselves because we behave badly or because we're being obnoxious. Um, or because of our fleshly behavior. That's not something that honors God. But even though it's not our goal to invite persecution, it will invariably come when we as a church and as individuals begin to act in ways that threaten the enemy's hold and influence on people. Persecution, even in small and subtle ways, can be a sign, actually a sign that we're heading in the right direction. The enemy has no need to bother with Christians and churches that aren't making any kind of impact for Jesus. The interesting thing is that the same characteristics that bring respect to the church and to Christians from some quarters in society are the same characteristics that will also bring persecution and ridicule from others. We're called to be a light, right? Light shows the way. Light guides our path. But when light is first turned on in a darkness, it hurts our eyes. It can seem like too much too soon, and we shade our eyes or even turn away. With the time change this morning, I first woke up at 5 o'clock. I didn't want to wake up at 5 o'clock. Turned on the light. Oh, it hurts. When I was a kid, we would often have to stay at my grandparents' place, my mom's mom and dad, uh, who lived in St. Constant outside of Montreal. And uh, there were times when, like when my brother was born, I was five, and so we had to go stay at my grandparents. And she had a C-section, so in those days, she was in the hospital for a while. And she had her, her gall gallbladder surgery, which when I had mine, took me three hours. She was in the hospital for 10 days. It, it was different back then. And so my grandmother would, would give us, you know, her room, and, and we would be put to bed, and the lights would be turned out. And then about 20 minutes later, we see this flashlight coming through the door. And my grandmother was standing there shining the flashlight in her, eye, in her faces to see if we were asleep yet. And even at six years old, I had this thought in my head, well, I was asleep until you flashed the flashlight in my eyes. And it hurt. Light can be painful and debilitating sometimes to some people. The very same light that points people to God will cause some people to turn away. They get turned off by the initial light, turned off by the initial pain of being exposed, turned off by the initial disorientation of having to see things differently, of seeing that there is a better way to live than they've been living up to that point. And instead of allowing themselves to be drawn further into the light and past the initial discomfort, they instead retreat into the darkness 
where they're comfortable. And that's why sometimes when we try to shine God's light for people, their reaction is one of, get that out of my face. I don't want any part of it. And for some, the reaction goes even further, where they will try to get in our face and cause persecution. Scripture tells us that we're supposed to be salt. Salt has healing properties, but salt can also hurt. Rubbing salt into an open wound is an expression, right? And it means doing something that's actually making things worse than what they already are. Salt in an open wound stings, it hurts, it can cause someone to want to avoid the salt altogether. The role of the church is to proclaim God's word. And that same word that brings salvation and healing and growth to many lives can also cause some to turn away because they don't want to face the truth of God's word, that God's word points to in our lives. God's word is very good, a double-edged sword that can point to things in our lives that need to be changed. And some people have a hard time facing that, have a hard time facing the fact that they need forgiveness and need to change. And they can get their backs up and even start to fight against God's word. So when, so when God's word says some things are a sin, where society says, well, they're accepted or even celebrated, the response of some is to try and shut down God's word, to banish it from the public square. And the proclamation of God's word can bring persecution. The goal of the church is to see people repenting and turning to God. To, to, in some societies, when that happens, when someone converts to Christianity, the result is that they are banished from their community and even banished from their families. They are treated as if they no longer exist. Their parents will say, you're dead to me. And yet they still hold on to the faith. In some extremes, they're even sought out and killed. Calling people to repent and turn to God can bring persecution. A healthy church will pass on its faith, will, will witness, will evangelize. In countries like Saudi Arabia, proselytizing, sharing your faith publicly is illegal. Even in a country like Israel, evangelism is technically legal, yet there are all kinds of regulations that make it really difficult, such as you're not allowed to convert anyone under 18 to Christianity unless their parents are already Christians. Evangelism can bring persecution. And even though we may not see persecution as part of our daily lives here in North America, it's something that is part of what being a Christian is all about. We don't talk about that much, but it's actually one of God's promises. Do you ever read your parents, or maybe you have one of these little boxes, it's a promise box, and there'd be little cards. I think I had one in my wallet. My mom used to have this little, it was a thing that was shaped like bread. And... Uh, yeah, they had these little cards. She gave me a couple to keep in my wallet. And there were promises. What's the promise say? If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also forgive. Colossians 3.13. I'm not sure if that's why she gave me the card. I think it was on the flip, the flip side one. But anyway, was, you had these uh, Christian families from back in the day would have these little promise boxes. But I guarantee you that this scripture verse, even though it's a promise from God, was probably not in that box. The second Timothy 3.12 says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not if, and, or buts. It's, it's, it will. it's going to happen. It's a promise. I think I've shared this before, but it's, one of, it's a defining moment in my life, so I'll share it again. I went on a missions trip in 1993. We were, my sister and I went with a choir, and we toured all kinds of areas in Europe, a lot of Eastern Europe, European countries, where the Soviet Union had just fallen in 1990, 91. Berlin Wall came down in 89, I think. So this was 93, so countries were starting to, to exercise their freedom coming out from communism. We were in a church in Estonia, which is between Russia and Finland, way up north, um, and it had realized its freedom from the Soviet Union just for a couple of years. And of course, being a, under the Soviet Union, being a communist republic, Christianity was persecuted and, and banned. But this church was now meeting in what used to be the communist cultural center. God is nothing if not ironic. And the, the, the thing, it was like a circular thing at the back of the platform that used to have a picture of Lenin in it. It's not been replaced with a cross. It was just so cool. And the, the singing was amazing, people singing in different languages. And, we, um, we had little 
headsets so we could get English translations so we could understand what the sermon was about. And the sermon title was Seven Keys to a Successful Christian Life. And key number five was persecution. And my immediate thought was, I, we wouldn't hear that in North America. <laughs> successful, a key to successful Christianity. And the pastor then commented, he's kind of matter of fact, he said, everyone here, you, you, you all know, either you or someone in your family has been persecuted. And I looked over the congregation, and you could just see the heads nodding. They, it was just a fact of life. And again, it struck me that I wouldn't hear this kind of a sermon or see that kind of reaction from a congregation in North America. If we are living out a godly life, we should come to expect some measure of persecution. So what might that look like for us? For us, what might that look like in our daily lives? Well, some may ridicule us. It may mean that we'll you know, stand out from the crowd, stand out in certain situations, maybe standing alone in some situations. Some people might stop talking to you. They may call you names. There was one girl in the very first youth group I worked in here in Port Hope. She was very strong in her faith, and her friends in high school knew that she was a Christian and a leader in our youth group, even a leader in our church. And she ended up picking up the nickname Church Chick. They called her Church Chick. And I think in some ways she wore it as a badge of honor. <laughs> she didn't quite see it as a pejorative. I think, at least it was my experience in high school, that even under, under the name calling, those same people hold a bit of a silent respect for somebody who's willing to stand up for what they believe in. Persecution will come when we live godly lives. It will come to a church that is determined to make a difference for Christ in the community. Yes, there'll be respect given to the Christian and the church by many in the community, but there will also be persecution from some. Are we willing to accept God's promise and live with possible persecution? And if we are, God makes another promise in Scripture, and that is that he will bless us. The passage we read from 1 Peter 4 says this, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. The insults we may face in this world are nothing compared to the glory that awaits us in heaven. If we are insulted because of our faith in Christ, now, not insulted because we're being obnoxious, but, but because we're, we're doing our best to live the light, live by the light that God gives us. We're doing our best to be salt in our community. We're, we're doing, just doing the best to, to live the way Scripture tells us. Then Scripture tells us that we are blessed. It tells us that God's Spirit rests on us in a special way. And I think that's because we get to experience when we when we experience the, the benign persecution we experience here, or in other countries, the severe persecution, we get to experience in some small way the persecution, the suffering that Christ went through. When we suffer for his name, we become like him in a special and a unique way. and We can all the more identify with him. There are those in faraway lands who have been called to suffer for Christ by giving the ultimate sacrifice of their very lives. And who knows that there might be someone in this room somewhere in the years to come that might be called to give that sacrifice as well. And I truly believe that when that happens, God gives incredible strength and grace to allow the person to go through that, that unbelievable level of persecution. But even if we're not called to physically die, to physically lay down our lives, we are called to die every day, to take up our cross and follow Christ. We're called to lay down our pride. We're called to lay down our desire not to be ridiculed or be made fun of. We're called to lay down our fear of being thought less of because we stood up for our belief in Christ. We're called to be willing to be persecuted for Christ, whatever form that might take. And the question is, are we willing? We said earlier that persecution comes when we start to invade the enemy's territory and the enemy begins to fight back. And the question we all have to ask ourselves is, when was the last time that we were truly persecuted? The last time we made the devil angry enough at us that he felt he had to do something about us. For when we really start cutting in on the enemy's territory, he will try and do something about it. As we as a church consider how we can impact our community for Christ, we need to know 
that we will receive a measure of respect from many in the community, and that's a good thing. But if we truly begin to cut in on the enemy's territory and touch the lives of people that he claims as his own, a measure of persecution will arise. But don't worry. Because when that happens, God says, you are blessed. Don't worry. When persecution comes for the right reasons, it means you're on the right track. And don't worry. Because 1 John 4, 4 tells us that the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Would you pray with me, please? Father, again, we lift up those around the world who are suffering from extreme, extreme persecution and are following you in your footsteps, a line that traces back to the book of Acts, a line that traces back to the cross, that are participating in the fellowship of your sufferings. We pray that you would give them grace and strength. And I pray, Lord, that when we get mistreated for our faith, when we suffer some kind of of ridicule or persecution, may we know that we are blessed. May we, we rejoice in being able to experience even a tiny bit of your suffering and, and so identify with you and be made more like you. Help us, Lord, not to fear what the enemy might do, for greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Help us, Lord, to be able to step into areas in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in the community, where the enemy it does have a foothold. And help us, Lord, to bring light Help us, Lord, to be salt. Help us, Lord, to push back and do the opposite of what's going on for your honor and for your glory. And if some pushback comes on us, Lord, give us the strength and the, to be able to handle it and the grace to be able to respond the way you would. Help us, Lord, to do things in this community that would earn respect and that would want people to be a part of this church family because they see something different. Let us not be afraid as well as a church if we reach out to the community and we get some pushback. Help us, Lord, to be able to handle that well, to examine our own hearts, to see if we might be acting in some way that is, that is drawing that pushback. But if it is truly just our faith, Lord, help us to rejoice that you are leading and guiding us. Lord, give us the strength we need to stand for you, even in the most difficult situations. And again, be with those around the world who are facing situations that are beyond our wildest imaginations. Strengthen them. Give them courage. Hold them in the palm of your hand, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.